Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Fuller, and I'm a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a webinar on the report that was just released titled Exploring Linkages Between Soil Health and Human Health. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website after the presentation. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private, nonprofit institutions that provide independent, objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have some members of the committee with me here today, but before they begin, I wanna go over a few reminders. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by the committee members, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen below the live webcast and type out your question. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Caroline, the study director for this project. Thank you, Hannah. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I just want to take a few minutes to uh, acknowledge um, many of the people who have been a part of this study for the past year. First and foremost, our study sponsor, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and uh, they provided the funding for this report. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues with the Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources and the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academies. They were, this was a collaborative effort between those two units. You can use this QR code or the report link below to download or a copy of the report or read it online. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge our committee chair, Diana Wall, who passed away in March just as we were entering the final stretch of this report. Diana's research in soil biodiversity and climate change was groundbreaking, and she contributed many years of service to the National Academies. We were very privileged to work with her over this last year, and we greatly miss her. I also want to thank the 14 other members of the committee who gave so much of their time and knowledge over the past year. It has been my absolute joy to work with this group of scientists who have been so collaborative and thoughtful as they work to respond to the study statement of task. And that statement of task was quite broad. We were asked to look at everything from connections of the soil, plant, and human microbiomes to the interactions of the soil microbiome with soil contaminants and information about soil-borne pathogens and toxins. To do that, we wrote a report that is organized as such, and today, members of the um, study committee are going to uh, go over it with you. Kelly Wrighton is going to review our One Health framework and the soil microbiome connectivity covered in chapters two and seven. Sarah Collier will talk about the connections between soil health and human health and the impacts of agricultural management practices on soil health. Mike Rusak will talk about the linkages between agricultural management practices and food composition and safety. And we'll conclude with Nick Poss's discussion of the interactions of soil chemical contaminants, soil health, and human health. With that, I will turn it over to Kelly. Thanks, Kara. Um, okay, so today the approach we took as a committee when you saw the statements of the past was to really ground our um, report in a One Health framework. And what that means is essentially in a One Health framework, there's three main components. There's human health, animal health, and the environment. Historically, in the One Health world, human health and animal health have been the kind of main motivators, and there's really well-established linkages between these two components. In contrast, the environment, uh, where soil resides, are much less understood in relationship to the human health. In that environmental component, 
Soils get a real brief mention in only one instance in the most recent One Health report. So there was a dire need to really understand the relationship between soils and their health and humans and their health. And that was really the overall objective of this report. We had kind of created a conceptual model that you're going to see our team using today. And so I wanted to orient you to this model. We're looking at soil health and human health in the gray boxes, and we're looking at the linkages denoted by the arrows. These can be indirect and direct linkages. Within those circles, you see the three constituents that we focus on, really outlined by the statement of task. Those are the microbiome, food systems, and earth systems. Today, as you can probably tell from my background, I'll be talking about the microbiome. And the flanking regions you'll see in the yellow, different practices or services that are provided by soils or change or modify the behavior of soils and their microbiomes to impact food systems, earth systems, and potentially health. And so as we go through this report, keep an eye um, on this will be your kind of grounding map of where we are today. Importantly, you're going to hear spaces where we may have presumed there was linkages and didn't find compelling evidence. Or we found maybe that the, the evidence that we had was so heterogeneous that we couldn't make a clear consensus view. And so in those instances, we, we diagnosed those or remedied remedy those with recommendations. Oh, next slide. Okay, so we're going to start with the vast biodiversity that's living in soils. Um, and so when we think about soils, we should be thinking about 60% of life on this planet, the species on this planet, reside in soils. And so the need to protect soils is critically important. Um, historically, when we thought about life in soils, we thought about the visual world, that world above one millimeter, the worms, the beetles, spiders. Recently, there's been a renaissance in our ability to look at life in soils, and we can do this through DNA sequencing. That's opened up a whole new view of what the microorganisms, these invisible living worlds that exist in soils are, and the reactions they catalyze and other values that they can have for human society. So I like this colorful picture on the left, um, as it kind of brings to life this kind of um, the living world in soils. However, I'd even go as far as to say this is an understatement for the amount of biodiversity that's in soils. A single gram of soil can have over 1 billion cells of microbes and house over 100 meters of mycelia, fungal, kind of fungal infrastructure. Next slide. So with that, there was a real interest in understanding how can impacts of the soil microbiome affect plant microbiomes or cropping outcomes? And how could, and nutrition potentially, and how could the soil microbiomes more directly impact humans or human microbiomes? We summarize literature on environmental exposure, exposure that can have health outcomes, particularly um, into the central nervous system, um, as well as metabolic outcomes. We do review the literature and show that soils are untapped resources for medicinal discovery. 50% of the antibiotics that we use today are derived from soil microorganisms, and chances are if you're on a cholesterol-lowering drug, it was also derived from soils. So beyond all the other excellent reasons you're going to hear for protecting soil biodiversity, this untapped res reservoir is another. We spent a lot of time at the end of this report trying to understand the role of microbiomes as diagnostic for health in both human and soil systems. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this area, and we kind of parallel the, the efforts across these two components. Where we, we did not find compelling data for linkages was actually addressing the task one goal. There was an unclear relationship between soil microbiomes and their impact on human microbiomes, and then those in microbiomes impacting human health. What we could say is that when so in animal models, so not with humans, in animal models, there's some compelling evidence, about three to five studies, showing a healthy soil with an intact microbiome can have outcomes of gut microbiomes with greater persistence and stability. So there may be a relationship worthy of pursuing in the future. Next slide. We summarize our recommendations into three camps. First, it's how do we do more with the data we have. There's, because of the heterogeneity in microbiomes across soils and even in our own bodies, there's a need to kind of mine the data and use it synergistically. In order to do that, we need better data reuse. 
and reuse that allows for incorporation of the metadata or the environmental data context. We're making a huge strides in terms of decoding the microbiome today, but similarly, we need the diagnostic plant forms to translate those indicators into real diagnostic information. Um, an example of this is we can go out to soils and with one dollar we can measure, uh, have continuous monitoring of the water. Could we imagine something similar in the future of microbiomes? And lastly, the evidence that I described that was missing in linking human microbiomes and soil microbiomes is really because most of this research is, in, is not cross-disciplinary or cross-domain at this point in time. And so to address questions of that nature, we would need um, research support or incentives to allow for those cross-domain collaborations. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah. Hey, thanks, Kelly. So the soil microbiome, in conjunction with soil chemistry and soil physical structure, drives processes that determine important factors like the amount of nutrients that are available to plants, um, the loss or retention of nutrients and water, uh, and the recycling and remediation of organic waste, contaminants, and pollutants. And these soil-based processes support numerous essential services then that benefit people. Um, some of these are material benefits, like supporting food production, and others have to do with regulating essential earth systems, like climate. Collectively, these are often referred to as ecosystem services, but for this report, the committee adopted the broader term nature's contribution to people, or NCPs, to underscore the importance of recognizing that these services are valuable not only in their biophysical and their monetary senses, but also in terms of their social and cultural value. Next slide, please. So the committee reviewed the many soil-derived NCPs and concluded that, firstly, these are absolutely critical, non-negotiable ways in which soil health supports human health. With some, the link between soil and humans is direct, and for others, it's indirect, but no less critical. The committee also concluded that, not surprisingly, while the value of material NCPs like food production are frequently realized, the risks and the costs associated with degradation of um, the regulating and non-material NCPs, like water quality or cultural value, um, are more frequently external and borne by society across spatial scales. And this discrepancy sets up trade-offs between NCPs that can be difficult to quantify. So effectively grappling with these trade-offs requires a better empirical understanding of how derived NCPs affect human health and societal outcomes, like, for example, through food security. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, to advance understanding of soil-derived NCPs, the committee recommends action in three areas. The first relates to quantification, so prioritizing research to better characterize and monitor soil-derived NCPs, particularly the regulating and the non-material NCPs and the linkages between them. So, an example would be improving our understanding of how factors like, say, nitrogen cycling or soil structure affect human health and societal outcomes like food security or agricultural livelihoods, and improving our ability to quantify these effects. And improving um, the quantification of NCPs will help uh, improve our ability to value them against one another and to make well-informed decisions about trade-offs. The second recommendation is about preserving soil habitat and biodiversity. Um, soil biodiversity needs greater prioritization in landscape and habitat management because it's critical not only for current services, but for potential future services like undiscovered antibiotics that you just heard about, and the capacity for resilience, especially in the face of climate change. And then finally, we recommend research that explores ways in which benefits to, um, from soil-derived NCPs can be enhanced. Two examples of this are um, soil suppression of plant diseases and mineral weathering to capture and store carbon dioxide. In both of these examples, uh, benefits could likely be enhanced if we better understood how soils perform these functions. Next slide. The committee was also tasked with examining linkages between soil management practices and human health-related factors. And recognizing that in many cases, like with NCPs, the impacts for human health derive not just from discrete management practices, but from overall soil health and soil function, we address this task by first just reviewing the impacts of agricultural management practices on soil health. Next slide. 
Um, the committee found that the evidence supports, as USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service recommends, that agricultural management practices that minimize disturbance and maximize uh, crop biodiversity, maintain living plants and living roots, and keep the soil covered will build soil health. However, many of these uh, many beneficial practices do have potential downsides. So, for example, um, no-till minimizes disturbance, but often relies on herbicides to control weeds. Nutrient application maximizes crop yields, but over-application can harm water and air quality. And this, again, introduces the concept of trade-offs and the importance of high-quality information, tools, and approaches to optimize the management of trade-offs. Next slide. So, therefore, to improve soil health, which in turn supports human health, the committee recommends development of a coordinated national, national, <laughs> national approach to monitor soil health. Over time, this would enable comparison among management practices, soil types, locations, and environmental conditions uh, in order to better tease apart the effects of numerous complex and context-dependent factors on soil health. We also recommend support for longer-term and on-farm research that involves scientists, farmers, and industry in order to promote uh, understanding of slower soil processes that can affect soil health in real-world conditions. The report also recommends prioritizing research into practices that overcome trade-offs related to common agricultural practices, like the example of no-till and herbicide use, um, and also research to increase the safe and effective use of underutilized resources. For example, here, to take the case of recovered resources like reclaimed water and biosolids, where on the one hand, their use can reduce pressure on fresh, freshwater resources um, and lessen demand for synthetic fertilizers. But on the other hand, their use is often also associated with the introduction of soil contaminants. So research that enables increased use of manure and biosolids by screening for and removing contaminants before they're applied would aid in minimizing this type of trade-off and maximizing the resource stewardship. And then the last two recommendations, the last two bullets you see there um, in this section are geared towards increasing cropping system complexity, because doing that will go a long way to promoting soil health. So, for example, um, increasing diversity in cropping rotations and increasing use of cover crops, um, incorporating more perennial crops, all of these are things that promote soil health. Um, by increasing soil organic matter and microbial diversity, while also mitigating insect, weed, and pathogen pressures. But making the adoption of practices like these um, widely feasible through uh, requires investment in and diversification of plant breeding efforts, which traditionally have focused on uh, more on food crops and above ground traits, are the things that we are engaged with our agricultural systems to, to get. Um, and that leaves a lot of untapped potential among the traits and the crops that support system complexity and soil health. And then finally, because practices that prioritize soil are not always aligned with those that most readily maximize yield, it's important to stress that the financial burdens and risks of diversification can't be placed only on the shoulders of producers. And therefore, the committee recommends that farm support programs consider soil health as an additional metric of success and risk mitigation and provide assistance like insurance and incentive for land managers to transition into more complex systems that promote soil health. And so now I'll hand things over to Mike to talk about linkages between agricultural management practices and food composition and safety. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so one of our other tasks was, in fact, to look at this linkage between um, management practices, soil management practices, and our food supply. Um, and in particular, our, our food supply um, with respect to nutrient density in our foods, the composition of our foods. Uh, we know that, and so in order to undertake this task, uh, we did look at the effect of management practices on both food composition and food safety, um, recognizing that both are very important for human health. Um, we know, of course, that nutrient availability in the soil uh, environmental conditions, of how the plants are grown, uh, management practices that are used, which can vary quite dramatically across different environments, as well as plant genetics, all play a part in determining uh, nutrient density in the food supply. And so, as I said, we looked at food composition, uh, we looked at food safety from the standpoint of foodborne pathogens, and to some extent, the mycotoxins that are derived from some of those pathogens. 
Uh, and we also looked at um, food processing aspects, uh, recognizing that the whole um, food value chain, you know, from farm to fork, also in involves the food industry and the processing of our foods and food ingredients. And lastly, we also looked at the consumer at the other end of the spectrum, um, who themselves, because of our food choices, will have an impact on the crops that are grown um, and the effect of those crops on our soils. And so really looking at the whole system um, from one end to the other and, and in both directions. Next slide, please. And so um, this area of, of food composition um, really sort of stems from a common perception that healthy, well-managed soils um, result in healthier, more nutritious foods. Um, and what the committee found by reviewing the evidence is that that connection is not always clear. Um, the, the results that are yielded from different production systems on nutrient density are not always consistent. And at this point, I should, I should make the point that um, the report focuses primarily on, on crop production, food crop production, um, but we do touch to some extent on forages as well as livestock. Uh, but the task was to really focus more on, on cropping systems, food crops. Um, so we did find, um, as I said, that uh, inconsistent results um, we do see that different um, cropping systems, different, um, excuse me, different management practices do have an influence on the density of nutrients in foods, but it really is differs between um, what those uh, management practices are, the different environments, the different crops that are grown. And so we were not able as a committee to really come up with a, a defined um, role for how a particular management practice um, led to a particular result. Uh, it's important to note that nutritional quality, as we looked at it in the report, uh, really uh, focused on both essential nutrients, things like minerals, vitamins, um, protein, carbohydrates, lipids, fiber, uh, but we also look at quality from the standpoint of health uh, beneficial phytochemicals or, or bioactives that we, we believe have an impact on improving human health. We, we have evidence in the literature that uh, the quality of these compounds um, uh, is determined, obviously, by what ends up in the edible part of the plant. And we also found that management practices, um, while sometimes impact that end product, uh, they don't always impact um, the edible portion of the crop. So, for instance, sometimes a management practice will provide more mineral availability in the soil. Those, that, those minerals then are absorbed to a higher extent in the, in the crop plants, uh, but they don't necessarily get into the edible portion, such as a, a grain crop, into the seeds, um, at least at, as the extent to which they get into the vegetative tissues. Another important component that we found was that um, different management practices um, have an effect on yield, but that yield can have actually an inverse effect on the density of nutrients in those crops. And so when yield goes up in a crop because of better soil health or better um, uh, production systems that minimize stress on the plants, um, Sometimes there's a dilution effect for minor compounds in the edible portion of the plant. So, for instance, if starch or lipids, oils go up in a, in a seed crop um, as major um, components of that seed, um, micronutrient minerals like iron or zinc or some of the phytochemicals may actually go down in concentration um, because of this in increase in yield. Another aspect of that um, effect on minimizing stress on the plants is that many of our health beneficial phytochemicals are actually signaling or response compounds made by plants in response to stress, whether that be environmental stress in some cases or um, pathogen or insect stress. Um, and so uh, these, what happens then with some management practices by reducing stress on the plants, making them actually have higher yield and, and are, are in a better state, um, those production of those compounds may actually decline. And so their, their composition in the edible portion can go down as well. 
and we found, again, inconsistent results for this, uh, depending on the phytochemical that was looked at and depending on the type of stress that might be mitigated by the management practice. Um, as I mentioned, in, uh, I think in the last slide, um, plant genetics also plays a large role in nutrient density. We know that um, different cultivars, different genotypes of crops grown in the same environment and have vastly different um, uh, levels of nutrients and phytochemicals. And so this plays a part in this in terms of how those different uh, cultivars respond in different soil environments and in response to different management practices. And again, um, we noted the evidence is out there that this variation exists, but the extent, uh, the, the data are very limited in terms of how these management practices affect across these cultivars. Um, and lastly, I mentioned food processing, that we looked at this as an important component of the whole farm to fork continuum. Um, we know that food processing is very important in our food supply. Um, we use food processing, almost all of our foods or food ingredients are processed in some way, uh, really to either improve food safety um, or to improve palatability of our foods. And we also know that these techniques can have an effect on nutrient density, um, removing or, or reducing levels in certain cases, um, while at the same time can either improve or, or enhance the availability of nutrients in the consumed product. So there's a mixed bag with that um, aspect as well. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that background and that analysis of the, of the available literature um, and where we saw gaps in our knowledge, the committee recommended uh, a series of, of recommendations um, in this area of, of nutrient density and, and food composition. And these are summarized by these four points here. Um, first of which is that we recommend that more translational research be conducted to understand the effect of uh, different management practices on both the essential nutrients and the bioactive phytochemicals in our crops, and in particular with, um, it, with relevance to yields. Um, and so we have to be sure that um, from a food security basis, uh, we're still um, maximizing our yields and making food available uh, to the population, uh, but we want to make sure that we understand how those practices also impact um, the nutritional value of those foods. Uh, we recommend that more research be conducted to understand how food composition can be influenced um, with respect to the health beneficial compounds and how either management practices or breeding um, Sarah mentioned some of the breeding work that could be done with respect to soils health, but we also see a role for breeding to come in and help with understanding uh, how we can manipulate um, the health beneficial compounds, even in the face of management practices that might improve the or reduce the stress on the plants. So can we come in and, and better uh, maintain yield and still maintain higher levels of these compounds? Uh, we recommend that research be conducted to understand the utility of biostimulants um, in both nutrient uptake and yield and potential effects on indigenous soil microbiome uh, uh, members. Biostimulants are either natural or synthetic compounds or, or microbes themselves that are applied to soil or to the crop plants in order to stimulate yield or to reduce stress. And they're being used um, in cropping systems um, the results of their use is quite mixed. Uh, we find evidence um, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't in different contexts. And so we believe that there's potential with these, uh, but more understanding is needed uh, to really promote them um, and to derive their benefits. And lastly, again, with the food processing um, uh, technologies, uh, we would like to see more research done on how those different techniques um, uh, can be managed to enhance the profile of nutrients, um, both essential nutrients and, and health beneficial compounds. Um, we recognize that, um, that, that there are effects. And so, you know, can we manage them better? Um, and hearkening back to Sarah's comments about uh, waste streams and unused things that, um, you know, were going into soils, we know that food processing uh, has a lot of uh, streams that come out of the food processed uh, 
um, uh, techniques that may not go directly into the food supply. And so we also uh, recommend more research be done on that component of the food processing chain uh, to either extract additional phytochemicals or nutrients out of those for use in foods or see what other benefits uh, those can be used for um, application in soil um, or other uses. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Nick uh, to talk about contaminants. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, our focus was on the uh, connections, interactions of soil health, soil microbiome, and soil contaminants. We looked at three case studies, one in heavy metals, metalloids, specifically lead, arsenic, and cadmium. We looked at microplastics, and we also looked at PFAS. Uh, we selected these three contaminant classes because heavy metals have been long known to be an issue, a longstanding concern in food production, and something that we just have to know what the effect of soil management practices that are being done for soil health have upon these availability of these heavy metals and effect on human health. Uh, we looked at two emerging contaminants that we don't know a lot about. That is the effect of microplastics and the interaction of soil health, microplastics, and human health, and PFAS. What are these soil health practices and having on potentially food production and impact from PFAS? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to work my way through this slide. There's five things here, and there are also five recommendations on this slide. So to start with, soils have a memory. If you introduce a contaminant in the soil and it persists like plastic or heavy metal or PFAS, soil becomes a re long-term repository. And because it's long-term, it can pose threats to both human health and the environment. Uh, heavy metals such as lead um, are really common legacy contaminants that come from past paint, uh, smelters, sources that we don't usually have, but this lead is still in the soil. It's a big issue in urban soils where we had most of population and also uh, leaded gas and industrial production. Um, this becomes an issue when we're looking at production urban agriculture, and also exposure of children to dust with lead. So PFAS is a little, so we kind of know where to look for lead. It's in the urban areas generally associated with legacy contaminants. Uh, the extent of microplastics and PFAS is a little less known. Um, we know where plastic use is in agriculture that can lead to microplastics. That's how it gets introduced into the soils. With PFAS, it, it's a lot, there's a lot of information that's being collected and a lot of things we, we're not quite sure where the high levels are or where we should focus our efforts. Uh, so we were, our recommendation to committee is to map some soil chemical contaminants uh, to identify what levels are particularly high and may be of concern, especially in agricultural food production systems. Humans are exposed to contaminants by several pathways. Inhalation of dust or soil ingestion, dermal contact or direct food consumption. There's also drinking water consumption. Most contaminants that we're exposed to from the soil do not result in harm. The contaminants that actually get into our bodies, they get absorbed into our systemic circulation, our blood, or into our bodies, they're termed bioavailable contaminants. Those bioavailable contaminants pose the most threat. Once they're in a body, that's where the harm can be done. The amount of bioavailable contaminant for many emerging contaminants, including PFAS, is unknown. We don't know which forms are unknown. So it's hard to determine what the effect of soil health practices will have on the availability of these contaminants. 
but we suspect that the literature is showing that many practices may actually reduce the bioavailability and potential harm to humans. Um, it would be good to see federal agencies support interdisciplinary research to reduce gaps about those exposure pathways to contaminants and soils. And especially with regard to bioavailability, what the effect of these practices are on bioavailability. Um, mitigation, contam mitigation of contaminants in wastewater and biosolids. In, in short, we should do everything we can to keep these contaminants out of our soil. We should find ways to reduce PFAS and plastic introduction or metals into our soils. Um, one, wastewater and biosolids are both known to have microplastics, PFAS, and some heavy metals. The heavy metal story with biosolids, biosolids are a byproduct of sewage treatment. The heavy metal story is a good one. Uh, once identified that this was a problem, federal regulations were passed in 1993 to remove most of the heavy metals from the biosolids. Biosolids is an organic amendment. It actually improves soil health and crop production so we can get the benefits without the contaminants. Uh, PFAS in microplastic is a different issue. We have to try to figure out how to keep these materials out of biosolids and out of wastewater that might be used in agricultural production systems. So in, including that, there probably needs to be some regulation of how much is allowed to be in the uh, in the biosolids or wastewater, and some agencies like USCPA are working on that now actively. Um, in that thought, we'd like to reuse beneficial materials like biosolids, which promote soil health and food production, without the contaminants. So, how do you remove the contaminants? There's been very little, but some very encouraging work that the committee was presented from a group from Finland, where converting biosolids into biochar removed all of the PFAS and some of the trace or organic compounds like pharmaceuticals. This could be a very attractive approach that would allow us to get the benefits from biosolids in the form of biochar biosolids, improve soil health, but also remove the contaminants before they're land applied. So research should definitely be conducted to look at this, these technologies and these approaches. So of removing PFAS, possibly microplastic from biosolids by biochar production. Um, we should be adopting practices that improve soil health. We are things like increasing soil organic matter and biodiversity. And these practices are usually conducted by adding soil amendments that are rich in organic matter that promote healthy microbial communities. And these amendments also have the ability to detoxify and immobilize contaminants that might be in the soil. So they're actually used to remediate lead contaminated soil or PFAS contamination. So it's a win-win. You add a or soil organic amendment to the soil, you improve the soil health, and you also reduce the contaminant bioavailability. More research is needed on which practices are the most effective at interacting and reducing the contaminant bioavailability. Um, there are some designer biochars and biosolid biochar materials that are being used for remediation of soil. These materials also benefit soil health and research in that area could be used, especially in urban areas where we wanna do food production, we, but we wanna produce safe food that ha is free of contaminants such as lead and cadmium. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the big picture is one health and one health should be valued because soil health 
ecosystems, soil health ecosystems, when they're healthy, improve the health of other ecosystems. So soil health will promote plant health, human health, and animal health. And the connection between all of this is the microbiomes. So if we're going to be increasing awareness, we want to tell people that, you know, it's not just soil health in a vacuum. The reason you want to improve soil health is it's connected to all of these other ecosystems like plant health, human health. If you have unhealthy soil, you're going to have probably unhealthy plants and you'll probably all have unhealthy people. Uh, research is needed exactly to document what improvements in soil health are needed to actually make those connections to one health and human health and plant health. But it's a holistic system. So we should be thinking about not soil health in a vacuum, but soil health connected to a one health system and shift the way we're thinking of things. The importance of soil health has societal value uh, much farther beyond just crop production. Thank you all so much for your presentation. Um, now we'll get started on our, our Q&A portion. And I'd just like to remind everybody that if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to drop them into the, the Q&A box. And, and like I said, we'll try to get to as, as many as we can in the next 17 minutes or so. So uh, first up, uh, our first question is, what does the report have to say about pathogens in soil that cause foodborne illness? Mike, do you want me to take a stab at that? Sure. Okay. And then you can help me fill in the gaps too. And, and Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, in terms of foodborne illness, we looked at the ways in which um, pathogens can basically be inoculated into humans. And in one box in 5.5, five, we did discuss ingestion of soils and through wounds, but our focus area in this report was really through food systems. Um, so we looked at some of the major pathogens um, in terms of E. coli, Salmonella, Listeria. I mean, it seems like every other month we can hear about contamination of leafy greens or cucumbers, or cantaloupe, peppers, things of that nature. And so we had a focus on those and our focus was really trying to understand how different aspects of land management um, could impact pathogen loads. Um, and so we looked at it from a tillage perspective, from amendments and from irrigation. And is there, um, and so that was kind of the perspective we took in that section. It was really on foods and pathogens and how we manage soils and how it impacts pathogen loads in food systems. Any other questions or Sarah, Mike, you wanna add on? I'll, I'll I'll just add that you know the another aspect of this that we looked at was how the soil management practices affected plant health, which then impacted their um, propensity to um, have colonization by um, foodborne pathogens. Um, so you know to some extent, and and how that um, relationship between uh, the production practices um, having influence on how the plants were growing. Um, could, you know, perhaps resist um, their uh, ability to take on some of these um, microbes and also things that, you know, were the compounds like mycotoxins that were produced by some of them. I think back to you, Hannah. Great. Thanks, you guys. I wanted to make sure everybody got their input in. So our next question is asking if there were any discussions um, in your committee deliberations looking at the impacts of pesticides and other or organic chemicals on soil and human health. Mm -hmm. I can uh, take that one at least to start. Um, the report does include a section on pesticide uh, use and impacts on soil health. Um, and there's, a, you know, pesticides is a, a broad category of compounds, and we've got herbicides, fungicides, other uh, compounds. Um, so there's a fair amount of detail in there. But what I would say as a takeaway is that uh, one of those items is that it's very context dependent, right? What what is applied and in what context? Um, but there are 
you know, there are lots of studies looking at discrete and specific impacts of um, various compounds on certain elements of soil health, but measuring soil health overall is another um, piece that the report picks out as something that is a priority to, to continue to develop our ability to come to consensus around measuring soil health. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are there are there's certainly potential for negative impacts on, for instance, soil microbial communities, on the impacts of fungicides, on the broader uh, mycology of the soil microbiome, um, as well as the impacts of um, pesticides on the sort of the soil um, macrofauna as well. It looks like, Nick, you maybe have something too. Yeah, I, I could add a little bit. In general, um, the fate of these or many organic chemicals in the soil uh, depends on the mi microbiome and the microbial activity. And so if you stimulate the microbial activity and the enzymatic activity from those microbes, you'll see degradation. You'll see shorter half-lives of pesticides and many other organic chemicals. Um, and so in our in our section, we, we really didn't go after pesticides because there's so many and there's so many different kinds of chemicals. But I think in general, you'd probably be safe to say that uh, if you stimulate microbial activity and, and the right type of microbiome, right, um, you're going to see less impact from pesticide or other organic chemical on human health. Thank you both. Um, our next question is, uh, does microplastics include nanoscale plastics, which may have very different properties, behaviors, and health implications uh, than other microplastics? Um, we didn't really dig into the fate of microplastics at the nanoscale uh, in this study. We basically were staying in the connection between soil health and, and fate of microplastics. Um, the question is, there's a lot of different type of plastics, but does nano stay nano? So when these materials are introduced into soil systems, do they really stay on a nano scale or they become more of a micro scale uh, and lose some of those different properties and behaviors? Um, but that really was outside the scope of this study to actually look at the fate of the type or form or of, of, of microplastic. Thanks, Nick. Um, our next question is, um, are specific plant stress phytochemicals discussed anywhere in the report? I guess that I take that one. Um, you know, we really kind of kept it at a very high level, um, just sort of categories of, of talked about phytochemicals and bioactive health promoting phytochemicals at, at kind of a, a very high level. Um, again, it was, uh, there was so much that we had to cover in this report. Um, and so we didn't really, you know, dive down into any particular categories um, in the report. And I would just add, it's more of a it's kind of a a systems view of the complexity of dealing with things like soil health potentially mitigating plant stress, but plant stress being something that is, you know, uh, causing the <laughs> production of certain and, and like take that that system and like it's it's really complex and try to grapple with that. I think was a priority. As we're looking at some very very complex systems in the in the scope of this report. Um, Another question uh, about uh, that is coming in from the audience is, uh, did the committee look at the relationship of soil to the flavor of food? I would not say that we did that either. Um, you know, we did we did comment on. Um, yeah, no, we didn't. <laughs> I mean, we we looked we did mention consumer issues in the report um, and the importance of uh, consumer preference. Um, I, we also talked one of our recommendations was um, uh, research to be done on on consumer preference uh, for foods grown in certain ways um, where soil health might be improved. Um, but uh, we didn't get into the specifics of how any of the practices might have an influence on wine quality, for instance, or something like that. So, yeah, I thought that those consumer preference sections were really interesting for anybody who hasn't got a chance to get to that part of the report yet. Um, our next question 
is, uh, was there any information on worker health in your report? If so, what type of workers specifically, like agricultural workers or anyone else? That, that would be something that was out of scope for the report. So we didn't touch on that. The report does include a bit on, um, on for instance, different exposure pathways and things like that that are generally relevant to people, but specifically looking at worker health wasn't part of our charge. Thanks, Sarah. Um, our next question from the audience is, did the committee find any evidence that there is consumer demand for increasing nutrient density in fresh, of fresh vegetables and fruits? In other words, what is the economic incentive for farmers to try to increase crop nutrient density beyond just yield? Well, Sarah, do you want to address that or? <laughs> okay. I'll it's yours, it. yeah. All right. Um, we we did not find any firm evidence, you know, one way or the other. I mean, as I said, that was kind of one of our recommendations was to um, have more research that that delves into consumer preference, uh, consumer choices um, with the broader One Health perspective that, you know, soil health is so important. Um, you know, there are um, uh, crops that are grown that have a quality um, uh, component to them, and there is an uh, economic incentive for that, um, you know, for different and sometimes for fruits and vegetables, certain uh, grain crops, um, protein quality, for instance. Uh, so the farmers are paid at times um, on uh, compositional trades. Um, but um, we didn't really delve into that in a in a firm way, other than recognizing that there, you know, that consumer preferences are important in um, food choices, and and thereby the crops that are grown um, in our production systems. And I can I'll just add um, I think that that covers it really nicely. But um, the report certainly recognizes that there's a lot of interest in this topic, um, and also though uh, the fact that in the like a typical American diet, the importance of the nutrient content, like uh, density in foods isn't necessarily as important um, when there, you know, there's ample um, nutrient fortification available in our foods. So we're not looking only to, to particular crops for all of those nutrients. So there is a, a component that the report touches on of sort of um, difference across global regions of the, the relevance of this type of a focus. Good point. Sarah, thanks, Mike. Um, our next question is, could you say more about how the microbiome could be used to predict health status in soils and in people in the future? So looking ahead, um, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we did a very deep dive. Um, and what made the deep dive actually, um, I think, extra special in this report is that we had medical or clinicians as well as soil scientists addressing this very question in chapter seven. And so it's very extensive in the report. Um, when we looked at different constituents of the microbiome in terms of the diversity, in terms of the interactions, in terms of the functional attributes, um, to look for which, which, which are, or can we identify known products that can actually predict health? And there are some nice examples in the human system. For example, microbes in the human gut produce metabolites that are really key integrators of the development of cardiovascular disease. Um, in soil health, we do use attributes of the microbiome or microbial communities as indicators of health today. So, um, and those are, you know, looking at carbon enzyme assays, nitrogen mineralization attributes of the microbiome. The question I think becomes in terms of, you know, is, is getting a, a threshold or using those, those tools as a diagnosis, we actually need to have a quantification of that metric for health outcome. And so I think it, and it's so regional in terms of soils or in terms of humans based on our diet and our genetics, that kind of a scalable diagnostic tool from the microbiome um, is still several years out. We just have a few more questions few more minutes here, but I think we can squeeze a few more questions in. Our next question um, is about if there was any differentiation um, in soil health made between open crop fields and greenhouse grown potted container crops in this study. Uh, I don't believe we 
looked at greenhouse production in this study. So we were pretty much focusing on soil in its non-plotted form. Great. Thanks for that clarification, Sarah. So in our last few minutes, uh, I'm so thrilled to have all four of you here speaking on this panel. Uh, the report just came out this morning, so most people probably haven't had a chance to, to read the whole thing. So I'm curious, um, as you all look forward uh, into the next few weeks and months and years as people are really digesting this report, I'm curious um, what you'd like to make sure people are taking away from this webinar, what kinds of things you might want them to focus on uh, as they dive deeper into the report. So I'd just love to invite each of you to, to um, give us some, some final closing words in our last few minutes. I can go first and we can just go in the order we went. Does that work, guys? Sounds okay. great. Um, so in my mind, I really appreciated the One Health framework that the, the panel came up with um, because there was such an absence of representation in terms of the environment and its linkages to human health. And so really what sticks with me as I move forward and the spaces that I work in is this, and I think Nick, you did a nice job dealing with this at the end, is this idea that soils aren't just widgets that we turn for agricultural production, but really that the health of our planet and the health of ourselves even on this planet is really based on, on making soils healthy. And so I think that that was really compelling um, in, in the state of this report. Oh, that's great. And I don't know what to add to that. <laughs> but, um, but from the two chapters I cover, I would say that Kelly, you, you, you covered that one. I mean, thinking about these nature's contributions to people and, um, and just, realizing that some of the linkages between soil health and human health are direct and some of them are very indirect, but they're just very important. And so that overall recommendation of just raising awareness, I think it's like it's, set, it's something, the kind of thing we hear all the time, but it really is very important. And then the other piece that sticks out to me that we didn't get a chance to talk in much detail about, um, but is the importance of um, research and support uh, that that really um, promotes the complexity of our agricultural systems, both the genetics of those systems, the, the crop breeding, um, the, the architecture of the systems, everything together as something that is challenging, is very achievable, and um, will definitely benefit soil health and human health. Well, it's getting harder as we go along here to say more things. Um, <laughs> I, I would just say that from my perspective, uh, yeah, it, it, the complexity of the system. I think um, our analysis of the available uh, evidence pointed out the fact that um, there is a lot of interest in this linkage between soil health and human health, um, really through our food supply. Um, our food supply from a food security aspect um, is critically important. Um, but we also have to have um, nutritional quality in those foods. And so I think um, the evidence that we found shows that there is a lot of interest in looking at these linkages. And I would hope that our report points to, you know, helps point to where some of the knowledge gaps are to really um, show where those connections can be made in better ways to really improve our, our whole understanding and, and get to a better situation in the future uh, with our foods. Nick? Uh well, what I'm thinking about is if you think about the three contaminants that we focused on, plastics, PFAS, and metals, these are called forever chemicals. And if they're in our soil, first of all, don't put them in your soil, but if they are, um, we're going to have to live with them. So the way to live with these contaminants is to make sure they don't leave the soil. So you tie them up and make them unavailable, or you degrade them. And there's probably a lot of practices, agricultural practices using organic matter, biochar and other things that are gonna be good for soil health, but they might also be good for protecting us from these contaminants and promoting human health by preventing them from getting into our food chain, into our water, and if we ingest them, we don't absorb them. So I think to me, the takeaway is that soil health may not be just good for our food and everything, it may be a way of life that we're just going to have to have now that we, the ship has sailed and some of these things are in the soil. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, it's been so lovely to hear all of you present on this important report um, and walk us through everything. Uh, 
And thank you to everybody online who's tuned in. Um, it looks like that's all that we have time for today. So once you exit this webinar, you will be redirected to the report page where you can download the report and the supporting materials. And so with that, um, just one more thanks for our speakers and our study staff. And thank you all for participating.